What do you get when you put Vin Diesel, Russell Crowe, Leonidas, and this guy as a director with a smile that could save 10,000 puppies from ass cancer? You get an ARC anime. We have ARC anime before GTA 6. Wildcard launched the show randomly at 5am, posted a tweet, and called it a day. The last straw was dropped when they announced anyone outside of the US or Canada can wait 30 more globe spins to watch. Let's begin. Episode 1. We get a nice ARC logo popping up to remind us this is ARC, just in case there's any viewers with instant memory loss. The first animal to show up is a fish. Why not? I don't know. A dodo? The next shot reveals Helena, our protagonist, floating unconscious in the ocean. At least the game had the decency to spawn us on land. The silhouette of a shark appears. In this scene, Helena is two square inches away from respawning, but a second later, she's Michael Phelps herself 30 feet away from the shark. But the 60 foot shark somehow caught up to Helena Phelps when it gets interrupted by the screenwriter and a massive whale saves the day. Now safe in the beach, she realizes she has an implant on her arm. Then Adoto spikes her adrenaline so high that she begins to speak English with the bird. A flying spear interrupts their cuddling session and a new character introduced. His name is Bob and he's a World War II veteran. Helena gives him a whole lot of vegan Greta Thunberg mumble jumble of reasons to not kill the dodo. Bob explains he got here the same way and that the question is not where are we but when, a line I have never heard before. Bob hands Helena some clothes and then gives the dodo a smile that would get you 35 counts of sexual assault in today's age. Meanwhile Helena found an alcatino which she puts in her pocket. Animal rights only apply if you have feathers, sorry Gary. Bob explains one second he was in Normandy, the next here. Helena is like wait that was in 1944. Then Bob's like for me that was two weeks ago. Dramatic sounds cute. But the only dramatic thing here is that Bob has a spear and a stone hatchet in two weeks. He then asks Helena where she's from. She's like, I'm from the future, and reveals to him that the Allies won the war. This brings a smile to Bob. Bob don't smile often. Suddenly, an ominous sound strikes. The dodo, which has no visible ears, has the audacity to be scared by this. But a second later, he's staring at the horizon, completely forgetting the sound that had him trembling. Apparently, mezzo berries come with a sight of ketamine. As they walk through the jungle, they find the Mesopithecus group chilling in the trees, a Meganoir getting clapped, and suddenly, Oh my god, so epic, two Brontos taking a sip. Three trikes bathing and a Pteranodon flinging by at Mach 10. In case you missed it, the Pteranodon flies by once again breaking the sound of barrier, or the barrier of sound. Apparently the only guy who they could find to draw some PTs failed geometry and is still taking 6th grade physics to animate the PTs wing flaps. We then get a flashback to Helena about to do a speech in Australia. Then Big Pharma receives a massive shout out as she swallows some ketamine down to relax. She gets a text from Victoria that could have been made by ChatGPT if a 5 year old made ChatGPT. She is presented as Dr. Walker, and her speech is well-organized lines. Among the crowd, she spots blue-haired Victoria. This calms her down. Then her speech begins. A speech that can only be understood if you look at least 95% like this emoji. Basically, in the future, they will be able to bring back to life extinct creatures. There, I saved you from wearing glasses for two more years. Of course, the blue-haired liberal brings liberal flowers, then they kiss, to make any 10-year-old watching question their sexuality, while also ticking the gay scene box and claiming a fat paycheck from the LGBTQZ plus elite. Back to the arc, they spot a parasaur on the ground with an arrow on its, I think, shoulder? Bob thinks an arrow is enough to put down a parasaur and suggests putting it out of its misery. I have a feeling Bob applied the same thought process when a friend in Normandy got shot in the leg and he followed up with a headshot to put him out of his pain. The arrow was made with the same material as Thor's axe because as soon as they pulled it out the parasaur could stand up on its own. She then calls him Scary the Parasaur. He walks away but before dipping he turns around and thanks Helena and Parasaur knees. Bob questions how Helena knows all these dinosaurs and she responds with their PhDs and masters. But I don't get the big deal. All we had to do was download ARC and play for a few hours to become a dino connoisseur. Bob is then interrupted mid-speech by a stone arrow graphically going through his throat in a scene that could simultaneously demonetize 25 YouTube channels and end 45 childhoods at once. An archer and a raptor appears and an epic chase unleashes. She runs into a village that's being online wiped presumably by the archer. This is an accurate depiction of a bigger tribe mauling a clueless tribe for the fun of it. Fat guy with a hatchet gets dealt with five shots of technology and as soon as we're shown his eyes I knew it was Rockwell chilling on a trike. Behind Helena a with an accent starts yapping. Helena saves herself using the reflection of a metal shield because apparently raptors are sensitive to light. Rockwell caught a glimpse of this 200 IQ play and smirks or grins. I don't know what to call this. Helena then beats a guy and flax senseless with a rock then gets bouldered but because Rockwell saw her MLG play he spares her from the stone arrow treatment. She does however take a punch from Flak Tyson that sends her into a flashback. They reveal a conflict is ongoing in China and blue hair chick has to go help. Helena doesn't want her to go but smurf hair decides to go anyway. Who cares? Back to Ark. Rockwell immediately gives off weird vibes while he explains that nobody knows what this place is, but he calls it the Ark. We're then shown their village filled with raptors and men in flak. Prim flak, I presume. She isn't pleased by how the animals are treated in 
this camp, however. So Rockwell holds her chin. She moves his hand away and gets sent back to the 1890s. Then Rockwell says exactly this. You're going to be a good girl. Helena affirms her being from the 21st century, displaying a perfect headbutt Zidane in the World Cup style. Helena runs around like Post Malone in circles and is eventually stopped by a Rex. The Dodo is alive because KFC wasn't invented until 1952. The Rex roars and somehow this doesn't cause a flashback, but we get a new character introduced, Nerva from the Roman Empire. Just 20 minutes into the series and Helena is already caged. Then Shockus gets a cameo. It's alright, I had just run my blade. Rockwell teaches Helena a lesson, or in this case gives her an explorer note by sacrificing Shockus in front of her. Shock begs the devs to save him again this time, but is denied. Nighttime hits and it's time for a flashback. The police are here to tell Helena her blue-haired Victoria was shot by Andrew Tate after a heated debate over women's parking rights. Helena then gets another sponsorship from the pharmaceutical industry and I assume she also dies from an overdose. The orchid vase breaking and the liberal door opening where she reunites with Victoria is apparently what the director called symbolism. We hear Tate's glizzy go off. Women can't drive. Duh. Killing Victoria and the colors go from blue to red, clearly signifying Helena is going to vote for Trump 2024. This is confirmed when back at the Ark, a blonde woman hands her the red pill and Helena devours it. Scary the Parasaur makes an unnecessary appearance just to say that he's alive and then randomly goes away again. By the way, this whole time the snail has been in her pocket. Snail gets about 5 seconds of fresh air until Rockwell appears and the snail goes back into solitary. The blonde girl speaks gibberish. Well, as they take Helena away to speak with the tribe leader Nerva. They get to know each other and understand their time zones, as much as a gladiator from the Roman Empire can understand science or a woman even knowing science. Apparently in ancient Rome, Nerva had spare time to study cartography and draw a sick map of Italy in his room, while the average American today couldn't tell if Africa is a continent or a country. Helena reaches for her pocket and then puts something on Nerva's cup. I wonder what has been in her pocket since she spawned in. Nerva shows Helena his artifact because he has no clue what to do with it. He then drops a bunch of artifact exposition on us that we don't care about. Basically, he thinks if he gets all three, he can go back to Rome with his dinosaurs, take down Caesar and the corrupt elite without realizing he is the corrupt elite of the arc. Irony. As Nerva places his lips on the cup, he tastes or smells the vile Akatina Duki laid on it. But Helena has a degree in dinosaurs and knows he will be paralyzed by Akatina Duki in 5.4 seconds. Then, instead of crediting the paralyzing venom to witchcraft, which half of these 16th century Neanderthals would believe, she gives away her secrets, allowing them to use it against her in the future. Let's not let this slide, by the way. She mentions he should be paralyzed for a few hours. She pries the artifact off Nerva's hands, takes his diary, and walks free. Until Rockwell spawns in behind her. But she had laid down raw meat all over the camp which hungry raptors go berserk for. Her plan doesn't work all too well on itself so Scary reappears to save her. Apparently in 3 scenes and 45 seconds, hours went by and Nerva is unparalyzed. Scary sacrifices precious brain cells to free a crowd of 7 slaves including a blonde woman who just speaks gibberish. The Dodo is also somehow not a chicken nugget yet so he comes along. After taking down 2 raptors, Nerva chases down 21st century junkie drunky Helena and after a life's dedication to the way of the Spartan, he is not able to catch up to a skinny woman that's also carrying a 50 pound dodo. He hops on Scary, who goes quickly from a reliable mount to a hard carry, and they escape the camp because the door was left open for some reason. After failing to catch up to a 21st century female, Nerva still has the nerve to chuck a spear over 40 meters and he actually hits her. This man was born in the wrong era. Today, he would have been first pick in the MLB draft to left field for the Yankees. Helena's reaction to a spear the size of a parasaur piercing her shoulder with an ah that could easily pass as a stub toe. Rockwell and Nerva basically say, R, we have to get our artifact back. Flashback, and I was wrong, she is still alive. Barely. A lot more pills and wine. Well, back to Ark, where she actually could be dying. Never mind, another flashback, and she dropped her phone, assuming she died now for real. And back to Ark, where her real life death gives her a second wind in the Ark. She removes the spear and uses her cloth gauntlet as a band-aid for the massive hole in her shoulder that works just fine. Because she has a master's degree, don't forget. The guy who animates PTs decides to ruin the end of the show by showing his awesome wing flaps again. The episode comes to an end with these words. I'm going to survive. Episode 2 begins with Helena falling off Scary, who once again drifts away. She is about to be recaptured when a new character is presented. But before we meet them, a flashback. We get to see Helena's mother give a cliche speech, and I quote, If we can't walk, we crawl. Okay, Shakespeare. Wildcard, point me to whoever wrote that so we can have him or her never pick up a pencil again in their life. Australia hears about BLM and drops their own protest this time, ABLM, Australian Black Lives Matter. I like how one of the signs just says respect. 
Australian white supremacists show up out of nowhere, causing an interracial squabble. Finally, back to Ark. Although an entire tribe is out searching for her, Helena sleeps by a campfire in the middle of the night. She opens Nerva's diaries and sees nothing. Unless the guy who drew lines for her speech back in episode one went missing and they hired a new guy who one upped them and said, how about instead of lines, we draw nothing. Then a round table full of wildcard employees agreed, stamped it and moved on. True don't show up, but we have a campfire and in the game, they're scared of fire. However, the show wipes their ass with this information and the Trudons run right past it, attacking the Parasaur. They fall down a pit and now we're dealing with a Sabretooth. I'm glad her way out of this one wasn't Dilophosaurus P or Megalania Drool. This time the screenwriter starts typing Chinese woman saves the day. Her name is Mei Yin and she visibly cringes at Helena's lame excuse of Chinese. This whole scene feels like the screenwriter messed up and realized next scene was entering the cave. So surprised, the pit Helena fell into by complete accident because of Trudons is also where the cave entrance resides. Coincidences, right? Mei Yin explains a bounty is set out for Helena. Then Helena is like, oh my god, he didn't turn me in. Wow, thanks. The next scene, an Arthur Pluera appears, but it's the size of a compi in the show. And Mei Yin drops an insane secret about them. They spit acid. They sit down and decide to chill, relax because a long trip lies ahead. And Mei Yin pulls out an otter she killed earlier. If I was Helena, I'd take this as a red flag. Who would kill an otter? Helena asks why Mei Yin didn't take the artifact from her while she was sleeping. And Mei Yin takes a chance to gaslight Helena with a love and trust speech. But in reality, Mei Yin could turn Helena into a sushi at will before she even realizes. Then, although nobody asked for it, a flashback. The flashback shows her mom talking about herself like she's a fighter, but in reality, she just holds up signs at ABLM protests. Thankfully, flashback ends and the journey through the cave resumes. They go through a moon pool that is totally balanced, and then we get a wide shot showing this cave is insanely OP. They should definitely add it to the game. This is followed by some serious expositional yapping that goes on for two minutes. <laughs> Mei Yin saves Helena from falling into a hole, but after a bunch of onyx fly out, we realize the hole is where they must go now. Coincidence? Helena cracks the code for the artifact, which is revealed to be the pack artifact. The gate opens and they've unknowingly summoned the broodmother. In the game, you need an army of 20 megatheriums or cap pumps, but in the show, Helena, who spawned two days ago, and Mei Yin have it under control. We get another flashback, and then Helena realizes that Aranios will turn on each other for liquid element. It takes about seven tiny spiders munching on the broodmother to put it down. This is Gamma at most. The real reward from this should be Tech Tur Engram, but a Tech Rifle pops up instead. Helena turns it on and decides to permanently nerf my dream cave by blasting a massive hole on the wall. Mei Yin says this weapon could restore the alliance and end Nerva's empire. The obelisk then shines green, telling the entire island something's going on. Because Scary is the only real genius in the show, he pops up again with his buddy KFC. Men in a Gilly pop up. The new character and Mei Yin know each other. Then she doxes his name. John John. I was thinking more like dances with wolves, but John works just fine. Episode 3. John's goons are all aiming at Mei Yin's head, but she pulls out the tech rifle like nothing and nobody is shook by this. Try pulling that off in front of an officer in the US with three shades darker than a Twilight vampire. But then a small girl pops up and they go from nearly ending each other's bloodlines to inviting them over to stay at the village and shoot the shit. So these guys live in the redwoods and they travel on Diplos. John and Mei Yin talk about their old alliance and she tries to convince John to reform it. The little girl whose name I still don't know was basically adopted by John when she spawned in. That's all you need to know. We get a nice cutscene of the village. Don't ask me how the Diplos get up there. Okay, they stay down there like the peasants they are. Then a Rex casually pops up behind the tree. May and reunites with their green Rex. We don't even get a name for it. But later in the show, we're supposed to care when it dies. Anyway, down the elevator like a boss is Henry, the inventor. This is probably the guy who leaves medium crop plot blueprints in your drops. So this is your chance to root for his downfall. Helena was just welcomed here and she's already walking into room uninvited. It's a room with a bunch of ill villagers suffering from arc swamp fever, aka COVID, aka AIDS. They haven't figured out transferring to Scorch gets rid of it. The girl walks in and drops swamp fever lore on Helena. Then the meeting John and Mei Yin were having moves into the swamp fever room. Helena is told the blue flowers healed people from the fever, but a big bird ate them. Now big bird lays blue eggs. So in a safe bet, Helena assumes she can heal people with the blue egg. Off they go on blue egg expedition, but not before we get a Native American flashback. I'm going to be honest, Honest, I have barely slept. I rewatched the scene 10 times and I still don't know what happened. But here's the flashback in 10x speed. Let me know what you can cook. 
Before they go to find the blue egg, Helena hops on Arena. The screenwriter then gives Aberration the finger by spawning in the climbing pick Engram on island. Helena then disturbs a Dimorphodon nest, but female Green Arrow saves the day with a couple of clean shots. They pause the mountain climbing and Helena gets to draw some explorer notes. She also practices her aim and then Dancing with the Wolves explains her face should be relaxed. We cut to dinner and we're revealed that the girl has swamp fever. Then her stepdad or adoptive dad realizes, so we get another flashback showing John suffered the loss of his family and village because he chose revenge over his family, which is why he is so protective of his new stepdaughter. There you go, John Lower explained. They walk right into a huge nesting ground of PTs, snatch the blue egg, and dip, but of course not without waking up every PT in the mountain. Awesome escape scene follows, with the stepdaughter saving the day hitting another clean shot. Things only get worse because now the PTs figured out picking, but then Helena relaxes her face and hits a 360 no scope to the PTs neck. Meanwhile John figures out how to ride a pteranodon with no saddle. What a G. We can always rely on the screenwriter to make some quick typing to save the day. Finally I figure out the girl's name, a lassie. They need to give her the blue stuff that's inside the egg quickly. So when we think we're about to witness a PT abortion the egg cracks revealing a quetzal instead. But inside there is smurf juice that Helena drops on a lassie's lips. Smurf juice saves her life. The grandma is healed and proud of Helena's wit. And now John lets a lassie join the council meetings because she hit some sick shots. Everything was sunshine and rainbows until the blonde woman dies in front of them. Then a guy in a perlovia starts rushing towards Helena, but he gets taken down immediately. I don't know what his plan was. The blonde woman utters her last words of gibberish and- <laughs> dies confusing everyone. A woman they can't even understand dies and now their entire objective is set around freeing the other slaves in the camp. Let's go hype. Episode 4 begins. They give this woman a whole funeral and revenge purpose for Helena. So they get to the mining camp and think of a way to infiltrate it. But first they have to tame a Stegosaurus. Why? Because we want to see more dinos. There's a juvenile Stego in the field whose trust they must acquire to tame the entire Stegosaurus family. A lassie somehow accidentally trips into a 40 foot Stegosaurus and then it chase ensues. But when the Stegos realized she gave the baby a tomato that grows on trees, they didn't know she was chill like that and rejoice. Time to infiltrate the mining camp. So in this camp, the soldiers force compies to fight for the fun of it. I already like these guys. Her name is Domina, our new villain, who works for Nerva. Alassie gets instantly recognized behind the mask and the plan fails in Olympic record breaking times. Helena is brought in for interrogation, but we learn about Domina instead and how she's a gladiator too. On the other hand, Alassie is dropped into a pit with two Dillos. At least gladiators were given a sword. In the game, Dillos have aimbot, but in the show, they become drunk stormtroopers. Domina says a couple of more generic evil things to make you hate her more, and we cut to our protagonist in chains. Good thing Alan the Arthro was vibing inside an arm's reach hole, and yeah, their spit melts chains. Oh, and her next plan is to whiplash a doe's ass with a metal chain to escape the mines. The Anki she hides by does nothing to help his tribe because someone whistled him passive. We run back into Domina and they scuffle. The blonde woman was called Annika, if you even care. Alassie convinces all the Yankees to inside their tribe somehow and freed the slaves. The bridge gets open and the Stegos begin to rush in. That's when Domina reveals her pet Utyrannus, who roars the dinos to chill. Mei Yin and Domina have a 1v1 and then a Rex saddle by John saves the day. This poor guy took 10 arrows at once, but only 5 men in Gilly show up. They must know some reload glitch. Helena gets thrown a bow. Rex and Yuri have an epic 1v1 over the bridge. Helena strikes an arrow in Domina's hand, allowing John's Rex to bite the Yuri's ankle. Apparently if the rider goes idle, so does the dino. Domina tries to make the cliche argument that the heroes are the same as the bad guys. Thankfully John ends the argument, sending her down into the depths. The foreshadowing here is obvious. We know water prevents all fall damage and dinos only take fall damage while being ridden. Helena is nearly stabbed by Ed Sheeran, but instead of taking an easy kill, she lets him get away after he begs for his life. He whistle follows his perlovia and dips. Second chance to shoot her shot, but she imagines the people she's seen die as the Perlovia rider and doesn't shoot. A disappointed Mei Yin ends episode 4. Episode 5 begins with Nerva giving a speech that shivers Rockwell's timbers. Basically, Nerva is angry at his incompetence. Nerva grabs Rock by the neck and bullies him more. Back at Redwoods, Mei Yin is training the slaves by making them do slave work. The slaves that she just freed. Makes sense. Helena brings her 21st century rights into this and stops their training 
training to let them rest. We get a Mayan flashback to her as a kid training with grandpa and her brother. Back to Ark, Alassie claims that setting this war map took all day, but all I see is four dino action figures and three humans placed around the map. The members of council call this strategy. Mayen led the last alliance into a slaughter, so Henry, who I hope you haven't forgotten, thinks Mayen shouldn't lead the alliance. So the council decides to debate over the alliance leader in five days time. Everyone leaves the council room with the game changing tech rifle in hands of Helena. If there was ever a time for some nice character development, it was now. Later in the kitchen, the Anki dossier is revealed to us and a Megalania pops in the room. We are given a reminder that the Dodo is still not a chicken nugget. Helena agrees to being trained while healing Mayan's wounds and so they begin to fight with sticks. Hide the stones before they break some bones. Helena trains her weight stat by carrying two Listros in buckets. If I was a Listro, I'd take this as a diss. Is Wildcard calling them chubby? She trains speed, running with Gallimimus, and then she leveled melee again. The Quetzal's getting bigger. John now says Alassie has a mind for a strategy, a callback to her action figure war map. Mei Yin and Helena play fight over her diary and Titanic music goes off in the background. The spark powders are going off. Serious yapping ensues, prompting a Mei Yin flashback where grandpa gives Mei Yin some sick CSGO skins that dropped that weekend. But when they were interrupted by ninjas who eventually take down grandpa, Mei Yin waits until grandpa is certainly slain to help, killing all the ninjas and avenging grandpa. This is no doubt one of my favorite scenes so far. This is an actual good flashback, not the Australian Lives Matter protest flashback we saw from Helena constantly. While walking around the village, a fireball launches into a hut. Mayan then drops mind warping information. We are under attack. Nerva and Rockwar are pulling up on Brontos. The village retreats while the main characters fight back. John takes the tech rifle, then asks Alassie to tell him where the enemies are. There, she says. John tells Alassie to run and gives her a knife. He's now copying Mayan's grandpa. Helena saves the old lady once again. Mayan takes down a bunch of men in flak. The villagers are chased into the swamp by men on raptors, but John tech rifles them out of oblivion. Nerva spots Mei Yin and jumps down to fight her. Helena the delusional tries to help this ends as expected. Mei Yin smashes Nerva's hat and the 1v1 begins. Back at the swamp, well things are going just fine. Rockwell then loads a Trank die onto a crossbow. I thought we needed long necks for this. Mei Yin and Nerva keep sword fighting, but then Rockwell shoots the dart and puts her to sleep, ruining the honorable 1v1 they were having. This makes Nerva mauled. The villagers take a final look back at their burning home. I hope they come back later for all that charcoal. Fade to black, episode 5 ends, episode 6 begins with a Mei Yin flashback where they celebrate a victory against the same empire who killed their parents and grandfather. Her brother wants a diplomatic resolution but may just wants more blood back to arc oh yeah she's in nerva's dungeon now nerva expresses his admiration for may it is revealed that nerva is the first face may yin lays her eyes upon same face he tries to bite off, but because Nerva has a master's in geometry, he stands right out of Mei Yin's reach. Rockwell comes in with food, but Mei Yin is in Ramadan and kicks it away. We also find out Rockwell incited Mei Yin earlier by putting narcotics in the Alliance's feeding troughs. Instead of leaving him on red, Mei Yin delivers spit to his left eye. The good guys assemble for a meeting in a cave and discuss extremely advanced war strategies with four action figures and a generic map. It's time to save Mei Yin but the walls are too high. Good thing there's a Megalania next to them that can climb it. Alassie makes a whole bunch of Freya curry or Enduro stew. I don't know, and I don't care. Alassie thinks she will be taken to tomorrow's battle, but John leaves her behind, cuddling with a Quetzal and a Dodo. Scary the Parasaur is also told to stay, but don't worry, he magically reappears whenever the screenwriter runs out of ideas to save Helena. Henry, who avoids every battle, gives John a bag of Adrenochrome. They shake hands, and John hops in the Megalania that sprints towards Nerva's fortress. When another Vietnam Vietnam flashback pops up. Mei Yin is presented with a dilemma. Save her brother or kill the emperor who had her grandpa murdered. The bloodthirsty son of a chooses revenge. The emperor predicts this move, which is why he brought every single last troop to the castle or temple. The director gives us a flashback within a flashback, which triggers Mei Yin into Super Saiyan mode. While taking arrows in the back, she jumps towards the emperor and stabs him in the heart. Then she also dies. Megalania begins walking up the 200 foot vertical incline. John gives Helena a flare gun and some spark powder to light the place on fire. Helena spots Mei Yin, crucified, and forgets the entire mission. 
Ariana is found by Ed Sheeran and they fist fight. She then brings out a bow from a fist fight and takes the shot she should have taken three episodes ago. Ed Sheeran then utters his last words. When your legs don't work like they you Helena frees Mei Yin. They smile and boom, Nerva shows up with 30 goons in flak. Helena then tells General Nerva to surrender while she is surrounded by probable death. Nerva obviously chuckles. John announces himself instead of just attacking them off guard. Rex is then rushed in and epic Avenger music takes over, followed by a fight montage. Rockwell is watching this situation unfold from the comfort of his porch. A horn is blown and apparently this can open a gate now. A giga comes out of this. Nobody heard the giga or saw it before. It's a complete surprise. It also looks nothing like a giga, but we have to assume it is because it's three times bigger than the Rex's. Mei Yin's green Rex dies and she is sad, but we only cry when dogs die in movies, not dinosaurs that we don't even know the name of. John cuts off Rockwell's hand, but don't worry pal, you'll soon have eight. Nerva and his giga seem to have won the fight, but dances with wolves is ready to dance. This is also when Elassie wakes up and reads a goodbye letter from John while he fights Nerva. 30 men in flak surround Helena and guess what? Scary, or should we call him Carry, the parasaur shows up with a gem tied around his neck which he swings around to annihilate the men in flak. Instead of just helping John, Helena dips and pops her flare gun, basically signaling, I'm safe, you can die now. Peace, good luck. Instead of chewing up John in one bite, the Giga gives him a love tap to the side. John smiles when he sees the flare. He knows that they are all safe and he can now go all out instead he just dies oh wait he shoots a flame arrow through giga legs and blows up the oil barrels causing a nuclear explosion and killing the giga yes the giga was killed by this but nerva is chilling john dies and reunites with his family in the afterlife basically to get to the ark you first lose loved ones then you die for those loved ones and then you spawn an ark when you die an ark you go back to your loved ones in the afterlife mayan wakes up and sees helena they kiss unexpected plot twist no we cut to an rg landing on a mountain and the writer delivers the news that dances with wolves has been clapped by nerva so the generic king in generic throne screams and finally i didn't want to spoil it but i have a cameo on the show generic king drops a whole lot of yapping and then pitch black we get a second season teaser the part two teases that fish lives don't matter brontos do neck curls bob respawns on scorched domina as i said didn't take fall damage monkey boss fight soon tech bow already rockwell's turning purple he also drops a hard quote for what what are the laws of nature? Yeah, whatever. Nerva has a tech sword. Vin Diesel gets paid a lifetime salary for saying three words. Let's do this. Don't worry, the flashbacks won't go anywhere. Overall, this was a really enjoyable watch. I'm hyped for season two. This idea of people from different eras reuniting in one same timeline is actually a really cool concept. Thank you, Wildcard, for this series. If this video hits 333 likes, I will make a review for the season two as well. Peace.